So let me start by apologizing because of this technical issue. Um, also, let me apologize for the change of title and abstract. And let me thank the speaker, the, sorry, the organizers for the invitation to uh, let me speak despite all these difficulties. <laughs> so I will be uh, talking about. Hmm? Okay. Yet another one. Thanks. And uh, how does it work? Okay. So we'll be discussing uh, non-abelian discrete gauge symmetries in motivated by string theory, but in a language which is general enough to apply to field theories as well. And this is work recently appeared in collaboration with Mikel Barasaluce Gomez, Fernando Marchesano, both in the audience, and also Pablo Camara. And it was partially inspired by generalizing earlier uh, abelian models developed in collaboration with Mikel and Luis Ibáñez and Pablo Soler. So discrete symmetries are very important in particle physics and in particular in physics beyond the standard model. For instance, uh, many discrete symmetries are proposed to prevent dimension four proton decay in MSSM and like R parity, baryon triality and generalizations thereof. Also flavor symmetries, both abelian and non-abelian are uh, often invoked to explain and reproduce Yukawa textures. So it's a key ingredient that could be relevant for physics at the next uh, energy level. So it's uh, worth thinking about them in from the point of view of fundamental theories like string theory or theories of quantum gravity. Now, quantum gravity does not like global symmetries for uh, different arguments. For instance, in a string theory, you can do microscopic perturbative arguments using worksheet uh, theory. Uh, but there are more general arguments using black hole evaporation in the sense that if you have some black hole which carries some global charge, it can evaporate <laughs> democratically and the local charge is uh, lost which means that there are quantum gravity effects that violate these uh, global uh, symmetries. So exact symmetry should be gauged. <laughs> Is there any way in which I can get rid of this? <laughs> Clicking no, here? No? no, 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 no. <laughs> 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 okay, thanks. <laughs> Again. <laughs> uh, so exact symmetry should be gauged. And the key point is that gauge charge is measurable from infinity. So you can run through this black hole argument. And at any moment, you can just surround or lasso your black hole and check what charge it carries and how it goes away from the black hole when it evaporates. So you can <laughs> track it and it cannot be violated. This argument is easy to understand for usual continuous symmetries, but it also uh, holds for discrete uh, gauge symmetries. You can measure discrete charges carried by a black hole or any charged particle by lassoing such a point-like object with a, with a charged string, which is always available in these in this theories. And you can measure the allonomy or the phase that is picked up by the string in this uh, in this process. So uh, you can measure the charges at infinity because it's a gauge charge, no matter whether it's continuous or discrete. So it's a good motivation to start thinking about discrete gauge symmetries and how they are realized in a string theory. So in fact, this can be easily understood from the field theory, just understanding or regarding a set N abelian symmetry, and that's the prototype uh, case of discrete gauge symmetry, just an abelian case, as a U1 continuous symmetry, which is Higgs down by a field which carries charge n. So you can start with the Lagrangian for a gauge field and uh, some a scalar of charge n, and you just focus on the phase, which is the relevant degree of freedom. So let's call this phase phi, and this is the relevant part of the Lagrangian, and the charge n of this field uh, is encoded here. The gauge transformation of these fields is just the standard gauge, U1 gauge transformation for the gauge field, and then a shift of n units of the gauge par mm, transformation parameter for the for the phase, which encodes the fact that there is a charge n here. So this um, theory with uh, just one axion-like scalar, axion-like in the sense that it has a shift symmetry, and a U and gauge field can be dualized, as nicely described by Banks and Cyber, to a BF theory in which the scalar is dualized to a two-form. Uh, it has this kind of Lagrangian, and in here, the set, set n symmetry, the order of the discrete gauge symmetry, is manifest in the uh, coefficient of the BF coupling in some suitable normalization that I will not enter in. This kind of description is very, in terms of uh, BF uh, theories, is very useful in a string theory because uh, it appears in several contexts manifestly in this, in this fashion. For instance, when studying compactifications of p form fields on Calabi-Yaus or other spaces with uh, torsion homology classes, one sees manifestly in the dimensional reduction that this kind of structure appears and one sees that there is a remnant uh, set n symmetry associated to the order n uh, torsion classes. And this was done by Camara Ibañez and Marchesano uh, in the Ramon Ramon Photons paper. In a more manifest setup, perhaps, uh, which is the work that we did with Mikel, uh, Luis Ibañez, and Pablo Soler, uh, this kind of situation is realized uh, 
in terms of uh, mm, okay yet again in terms of massive it's realized by <laughs> really is realized by massive uh, U-ones. <laughs> oh. It's realized by massive U-ones. <laughs> okay. It's realized by massive uh, U-ones on the brains, essentially because they have they contain this kind of BF couplings for the chair Simons, for the chair Simons uh, terms that they have in higher dimensions, and it's a matter of what kind of cycle they are wrapping. Uh, whether you have these discrete symmetries or not, and you can apply that uh, those uh, <coughs> arguments to look for uh, interesting phenomenological interesting symmetries like R parity or baryon triality in MSSM-like models, and uh, Berselekes will be discussing about that um, in, uh, in his talk. Now, to find the non-abelian generalization of this way of generating discrete gauge symmetries, it's useful to rephrase this set abelian case of uh, certain symmetries in a language which uh, encodes or makes manifest cer certain ingredients and in particular what are the relevant building blocks to generate this discrete symmetry. The first ingredient or building block is the existence of action-like fields, actions not in the sense that they couple as the uh, Pechi Queen action but rather as fields which have a shift symmetry or if you wish they, on they have only derivative uh, couplings in the, in the action so they don't, don't have a potential and there is some isometry moduli space you can shift them and that's a global symmetry and they have a periodic identification of the field is identical to the field plus one in some convenient unit. So in a sense, this phi parameterizes the real line, which is where the field is taking uh, uh, values. And uh, this field identification defines a lattice of identification, and the unit cell is essentially a circle. Okay, That's the first ingredient. The second ingredient is the existence of a gauging by a U1, in the sense that there is a U1 gauge symmetry acting on the gauge potential, but that is also acting simultaneously on this scalar, on this real line. And it's acting in such a way that it shifts uh, the scalar by n times the um, n times the, the, the gauge transformation parameter. And this n is crucial in the sense that uh, it defines a, wide, a winding number in the embedding of the u1 associated to the, uh, in the, in the circle associated to the u1, how it's embedded into the uh, circle parameterized by this action. Okay. So basically, this. Uh, when you go around the U1 circle once, you are going around the circle of this uh, scalar phi n times. So in this language of having the scalar parameterized in the real line, this identification or this gauge invariance is defined in some lattice, which is not by integers, but rather multiples of n. Okay, so that's the picture. This is the real line where the scalar takes values. Okay. Okay, this is the basic uh, identification period, field identification, and this is uh, the identification implied by the U1 gauge symmetry. So, the discrete gauge symmetry appears due to the existence of field identifications, which are gauge symmetries in the sense that it's an equivalence of field configurations, which are not implemented by the U1 gauge transformation. So, essentially, the certain symmetry is the quotient of these two lattices, the lattice of U1 gauge transformations modeled out by the lattice of field identifications. Right. Vice versa, it's, it's really the other way around. So it's the lattice of field identifications by the action periodicity quotiented by those U1 gauge transform those transformations taken care of by the U1 gauge symmetry. So one can generalize that very easily and think about the case with multiple U1 symmetries. You have a lattice of, uh, you have a, some Rn dimensional space uh, which corresponds to having many scalars. Each one of them has some periodicity of one in the different directions, so you have a multi-dimensional lattice, and then you have a gauging by several U1s encoded in this uh, partial Lagrangian here, which means that when you do the gauge transformation of the U1s, you are translating in some uh, lattice in here, and in particular defining some sub-lattice. Okay? So you can obtain the non-trivial discrete gauge symmetry as the quotient of the large lattice, or the, sorry, the more refined lattice modeled out by the uh, less refined uh, lattice. Okay, so the field identifications modeled out by those identifications taken care of by the uh, U1 uh, symmetries. And this kind of description can be generalized very easily. 
instead of thinking about just directions which kind of commute are orthogonal to each other, you think about uh, non-abelian actions. You think about fields which have shift symmetries but which are non-commuting. So the moduli space of these scalars is not just a product of circles, but rather it's circles fiber over other circles. So as you move around in different directions, you don't come back to yourself, but rather to some other uh, transform point. Okay, so you can think about these non-abelian actions. You can write down Lagrangian, which corresponds to gauging these non-abelian isometries, and you have complicated transformations that uh, kind of uh, ex express this uh, quantitatively this uh, this idea. And again, what you will find is that the discrete symmetry is the lattice of field identifications modeled out by those identifications implemented by the non-abelian gauge symmetry involving the gauging. Okay? And one can easily construct very explicit uh, examples. For instance, construct an action moduli space, which is a twisted torus, or a circle which is fiber over other circle directions. And, um, and then you can study these super lattices and find the uh, realizations of, for instance, discrete Heisenberg groups, which are defined by this kind of uh, commutation relations. Okay, now that we have this understanding of non-abelian discrete gauge symmetries in field theory, one can go to a string theory and see whether they are realized or not. And there are several ways they, they can be realized, and we studied several classes of models realizing them in, uh, in our paper. So the first one of them is to consider generalizing the work by Camara, Ibanez, and Marchesano, is to consider compactification of p-forms on Calabio spaces which have torsion homology with relations among them. And eventually these relations, that I will quantify later on, encode the fact that uh, there is non-abelianity in the, in the action moduli space, in essence. So the basic idea, in the abelian case, is imagine that you start with a type 2 compactification on a Calabio with torsion 1 and 4 cycles. So there are classes which are not zero, but a multiple of these classes is equal to zero. So you can start wrapping objects there to detect the existence of charged particles and strings, which is a signal of the existence of the discrete symmetry. So wrapped D1 brains produce set K on, on this torsion one cycles produce set K charged particles, and wrapped D5 brains on the dual four cycles produce set K charged uh, strings. And the existence of these objects uh, implements at the level of four dimensions the existence of this uh, of this uh, discrete symmetry. Now more formally, one can introduce an exact two form and an enclosed one form which satisfy this relation, which correspond to non-harmonic forms that in a sense are encoding the existence of a massive U1. The harmonic forms would encode massless U1s, and non-harmonic forms encode the existence of some massive U1 forming here. And the presence of this K in this relation is telling you that there is some remnant set K which remains in the theory. So you can do the dimensional reduction of the Ramon-Ramon two form uh, to display the existence of this gauge and structure using this form. And in particular, one see that in the Kalausakian reduction, you can point the direction of uh, dc2 in the direction of d5 time where phi is some scalar uh, times b2 or uh, the some uh, four dimensional gauge field times uh, b2 and essentially one can see in this structure that there is a gauging so when you do a u1 gauge transformation you have to shift the scalar which is the key ingredients that we had before <laughs> this is the abelian case now one can go to a non abelian generalization <coughs> and the simplest realization is pretty old it was developed by Gukov, Rangamani and Witten in the context of ads cft so already at the time, for very obscure reasons, they, real, they realized some non-abelian gauge symmetry that <coughs> appeared in a particular setup, and they realized that basically it was coming from torsion forms. So we just rephrased it in our language and checked uh, ex more explicitly that it really happens. So the basic setup is, again, you start with type 2B models on a Calabria with torsion 1 cycles and dual 4 cycles, and 3 cycles and dual 2 cycles. And the dual 4 cycles are intersecting over dual 2 cycles. So it's a mess of a combination, but uh, there exists Calabrias like that. Okay, So wrapping D1 brains and F1 brains on the 1 cycles and D3 brains on the 3 cycles give charged particles, and wrapping the dual objects, D5 brains, NS5 brains, and D3 brains on the dual cycles give charged strings. So in, in general, each one of these objects will produce a set K abelian symmetry, but there are string effects that make the whole structure non-abelian and non-commuting. And basically the idea is that if you take D5 brains and NS5 brains wrapping on these cycles, they produce strings in four dimensions, and when you cross them in four dimensions, there are new strings which are created in between by the so-called hanani witten effect. There are D3 brains which are created in between, wrapping precisely the two cycles over which the four cycles are intersecting. And the existence of this creation, the creation of these strings in the middle is a clear signature of non abelianity in the structure of uh, discrete symmetries. Okay, so that's a hint that this kind of um, 
torsion cycles with non-trivial intersection patterns uh, realize these non-abelian gauge symmetries. And in particular, one can take this language of forms and propose uh, the dual realization in terms of forms of this intersection pattern and perform the calus reduction to uh, obtain a Lagrangian which displays the gauging structure that we had discussed in the earlier transparencies. So one way to real the lesson to take home is that <coughs> one way of realizing these uh, non-abelian discrete gauge symmetries is to take P forms on torsion uh, homology classes which have this kind of relations or intersection uh, intersection relations. Uh, perhaps a simpler second class of uh, models and perhaps also more interesting class of models where one finds these non-abelian uh, gauge symmetry structures, uh, discrete gauge symmetry structures, is to consider a uh, magnetized toroidal models. So consider just uh, some compactification on a torus with some D-brains which are magnetized or even heterotic models which are magnetized with a constant magnetization. So everything is really very simple. You have some constant field strength on the two torus, that's a basic toy model. So you have some gauge field which is linear in some of the uh, translation directions. So the existence of a gauging in this kind of setup is manifest in the sense that when you do a translation in the directions of the torus, like shifting x, one can see clearly that there is a shift in the uh, y direction Wilson line of the gauge field. So the gauge fields are the, Wils the, gauge the Wilson lines of the gauge fields are shifting when you translate on the two torus. Now there is an algebra associated to this gauging, which is basically some uh, Heisenberg algebra. So basically, what that is telling you is that in the presence of magnetization the gauge transformations in different directions don't commute with each other as is the case in, uh, in the absence of magnetization but rather when you go around the two torus and find the commutator of the transformations you generate a U1 gauge transformation because you're picking up the field strength via the circulation of the, of the uh, gauge potential. Now this gauge symmetry has a non-trivial uh, this non-abelian gauge, gauge symmetry has a non-trivial action on the wave function of uh, charged matter families that you get when you put open strings or uh, compute uh, the spectrum heterotic models in here. <coughs> Essentially, the wave functions that uh, have this structure, the zero modes, uh, they have this kind of a uh, theta function structure, which is just the sum of Gaussians, and they depend on parameters like the Wilson lines through this, uh, this parameter set <coughs> and, 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 and u. So the two generators that correspond to the translations act as clock and shift transformations on this bunch of, uh, this multiplet of m charged matter families. So there is one generator that shifts one family to the next, and there is another generator, sorry, there is an arrow missing here, which just puts different faces to the, to the, different, uh, to the different families, okay? So for each two torus where you have this magnetization, you have this clock and shift action, or this Heisenberg group, this Heisenberg group action on these uh, m families of uh, charged matter multiplets, okay? By duality, this, uh, this kind of uh, symmetry is also present for models of uh, the t-dual models of intersecting brains, etc. So it's something which is very toroidal, but very general for any toroidal model, in a sense. Okay, now what is interesting is that these symmetries are flavor symmetries in the sense that uh, they commute with uh, essentially uh, gauge quantum numbers, but they depend on the family index, so they are family symmetries. And uh, they have implications for, or they constrain the Yukawa couplings that you can find in these in these theories. And the computation of Yukawa couplings in Toroidal model has been a substantial industry for a, for a long time. So it's interesting to ask what happens with these flavor symmetries and how they constrain the, the, the Yukawa couplings. So there are basically two classes of examples, depending on what are the intersection numbers, or if you wish, what are the multiplicities of the different uh, families that you have. Uh, so the first possibility is that the numbers, intersection numbers of different families are known non coprime and the second is that they are coprime so the prototypical example of having uh, non coprime intersection numbers if you have three stacks of um, brains uh, and the, the pairwise intersection numbers are given by m let's say so all the intersection numbers in the model are just essentially three so one typical model of that would be the standard model where you have three families of left handed quarks three families of uh, up right handed quarks and let's say you have three hexes okay so you have couplings like that, where one of the multiples would be Higgs's, the other would be left-handed quarks, and the second would be right-handed quarks, for instance. So what are the constraints that you get for these Yukawa couplings in this situation? Well, basically, if you realize these models in a toroidal setup with constant magnetic fields, etc., there is this discrete symmetry, which essentially is taking each family and shifting it to the next one, simultaneously for all of them, and there is another symmetry, which is rotating each family by a phase as corresponding to the, uh, to the, to the label 
of that field. So the discrete symmetry leads to some selection rules, which is that the Yukawa is zero unless uh, the sum of these integers is equal to zero mod m, and also uh, the Yukawa coupling of families i j k must be equal to the uh, Yukawa coupling of families i plus one j plus one k plus one. So this symmetry was already noticed uh, by Kremades, Ivanov, and Marchesano in the papers where they were computing these Yukawa couplings explicitly. So at the time, it looked like a coincidence that you compute the Yukawa couplings and they satisfy this uh, this uh, selection rule. Later on, uh, Choi and collaborators realized that, and Kobayashi and collaborators realized that uh, these symmetries were associated to some discrete symmetry, but in their language, it was not clear what was the nature of this discrete symmetry. In our analysis, it's clear that it's a discrete gauge symmetry and that this pattern will be uh, completely exact. There is no effect in the theory that can violate this selection rules, not even non perturbative instantons or whatever. Black holes, quantum gravity effects, wormholes, whatever. It's a discrete gauge symmetry, therefore exact in the theory. This, okay. The second class of examples, which is more interesting and corresponds to these co prime uh, multiplicities, uh, would correspond to something more similar to the MSSM where you have a one Higgs multiplet, essentially, one up type Higgs, and only one type down Higgs, but you have three families of leptons. So the kind of Yukawa couplings that you have is just a single kind of Higgs coupling to, uh, let's say, three families or m families of right-handed multiplets and uh, m families of uh, left-handed multiplets. And you have Yukawa couplings with only two indices. This kind of situation is realized when you have uh, the left-handed families appearing from intersections in a single two torus and the multiplicities or the different families associated associated to these right-handed fermions appearing from intersection numbers in a different two torus so basically in this setup you have two independent heisenberg discrete groups acting on x left and x right so there is one group acting on x left and another different one acting on x right and both of them commute okay and the question is if you are in such a situation, how can you engineer something which is invariant? You have something which is transforming the left movers, <coughs> sorry, or the left, uh, the left-handed uh, fermions, but not touching the right-handed ones. So how on earth can that be invariant? Invariant. Well, the answer is that the Yukawa coupling can transform because the Yukawa coupling depends on Wilson lines and things like that, and these Wilson lines are scalars that shift under these discrete gauge transformations, so they can transform as well. So the only way in which this thing can be invariant is if the Yukawa coupling factorizes in this way with a part whose transformation cancels that transformation of the left-handed fields and with another part which is devised to cancel the transformation of the right-handed uh, part. So the presence of this factorized structure for the Yukawa implies that the Yukawa coupling has a rank one texture. So there is only one linear combination of the left-moving fields which is coupling to one linear combination of the right-moving fields and those are the only massive fields. Now, this was again observed uh, let's say empirically or microscopically in the computation directly using theta functions, etc., by uh, Ivanez, Marchesano, and Cremades in examples, and it looked like some accidental property of these models, and it was not clear whether you could uh, violate it by doing different things or what one should be doing to violate it. The message now is that this is following from some exact gauge symmetry in this uh, configuration, discrete one, but an exact discrete gauge symmetry of the model. So this rank one texture is dictated by this symmetry and it is protected by it. And there is no effect that can violate it. <coughs> Instantons, wormholes, quantum gravity effects, whatever, nothing will violate it as long as you preserve this factorized torus structure. Okay, of course you can think about other perversions like twisting things so that you break this factorized torus structure, but in the model as it stands, there is no effect that can violate this rank one texture. Okay, in particular, one can think about instanton effects like those that uh, Fernando was discussing in, in the context of F-theory where some faraway instanton kind of um, can induce some terms which were uh, forbidden. This is valid in general, but in this particular toroidal case, there will be conspiracies of different instanton contributions that lead to cancellation because this rank one texture is again dictated and protected by this exact symmetry. Okay, so this model is hopeless. <laughs> of course, you can. <laughs> Of course, again, yes? Killer potential calculations being done in those models arguing that this could change the rank? Well, the question is whether the computations were complete or not. So it's possible that you compute part of something and then this part of something violates the symmetry, but then the symmetry will, uh, will impose that something else is around. 
so that both things, all things conspire and you get zero. And this uh, rank one texture yeah, is perfection. Can have, couldn't you have couplings which are invariant under the symmetry, but then a, a field gets a verb and breaks the symmetry? If you do such, such things, you can do that. I mean, I mean, you can give a verb to, to different things here and, and, and break the symmetry. That's fine. So that would correspond to modifying the model in some way, which would break the symmetry. So as I was saying before, you can do things that violate this factorization of two tori, like, I don't know, a tilt in the torus or change in some moduli that break this factorized structure, and then that could lead to violations of the discrete symmetry, and then uh, you could escape this rank one texture. But uh, with that, the only thing I'm saying is that in this model, as it stands, keeping it toroidal with this factorized torus structure, uh, make it unavoidable that you have this rank one structure. Okay. Okay. So I'm about to get to conclusions. So essentially, what we have been doing is spelling out the building blocks of abelian gauge symmetries, and this has allowed to uh, propose a natural non-abelian generalization, which is valid in field theory and was not around in the market. Uh, we have realized this structure in several classes of stream models, for instance, p forms on these torsion classes, and also in magnetized compactifications. And in this later example, they lead to very interesting implications for Yukawa couplings. For instance, uh, this rank one texture in certain particular models. I also want to emphasize that, again, this, uh, this thing is exact but very toroidal in a sense. So I cannot see any obvious way how one could generalize these kind of arguments to a theory where everything is curved and there is no na natural notion of translations like in the torus, isometry translations like in the torus. So for sure, the rank one problems that one finds in a theory are solved by a variety of mechanisms as Fernando was reviewing in, in his talk. Of course, there are many further questions that one would like to answer. For instance, uh, it would be interesting to understand more general discrete symmetries, like our symmetries uh, that were covered partially by uh, Radstock in the heterotic setup. Also, it would be very interesting to understand, in this uh, more abstract language, the non abelian symmetries that have been studied in heterotic orbifolds. And in particular, they will require new ingredients because they typically involve the so called uh, uh, quantum symmetry, which acts on twisted sector four before, which is something outside uh, what we have been looking at, in a sense. Again, it would be uh, interesting to understand further systems with gaugings. So the key ingredients in our setup was gauging of some scalar, some isometries in the scalar manifolds, and that's, there is a whole industry of uh, using gaugings to describe flux compactifications, and very likely, in many of these compactifications, you will find that some discrete uh, symmetries are remnant. So it would be interesting to understand the implications of that, for instance, for modular stabilization and things like that. Again, there are other sources of uh, discrete gauge symmetries which we didn't understand fully, for instance, discrete isometries. You can imagine compactifying on a Calabiao, which cannot have continuous isometries, but can have discrete isometries. And this is often done to uh, obtain, make quotients and obtain uh, non-simply connected uh, Calabiaos. But even in the covering space, it would be interesting to understand the role of these discrete uh, isometries and how they are encoded in the four-dimensional effective action. Um, it's hard to think about them as subgroups of some continuous group because the Calabrias don't admit continuous isometries, but perhaps in some sense, something could uh, be understood. In that paper, we studied one particular case of compactifications on twisted tori where these things can be made very explicit, and one could see that one could uh, describe the system in terms of these gauges, but that's because it's a very particular and simple manifold. One could imagine or ask the question of uh, how to go beyond Heisenberg discrete groups. The only examples we found were associated in a way or another to Heisenberg algebras, and it would be interesting to understand why that's the case. Uh, our guess is that that's because the simplest algebra that one can gauge, and then it would be a natural question to ask whether one can gauge other algebras and things like that. Again, also it would be interesting to go beyond the Torial models, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So as usual, uh, and this is a general conclusion uh, for this talk and probably for many others, there are many open questions in string phenomenology. Happily, I conclude with saying that many of them have been answered <laughs> in this book that you are invited to a visit in the in the Cambridge uh, stand. Thanks. Okay, before everybody forgets, uh, the books are on sale, <laughs> and then... Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, any questions? Yes, well, one of the exam, I mean, this uh, setup of Google, Ragamania, Witten, where they were interested in the AGCFT stuff, uh, 
uh, essentially corresponded or arose from the study of system of distributing some set singularity. And there is some discrete Heisenberg group which is acting there. The kind of generators that they had is kind of exotic from our point of view in a sense, because there is one generator which is rotating the quiver. So it's acting on trivially mapping one factor in the gauge group to another factor in the gauge group. Okay, so it's acting as a rotation in the quiver, and then there is another generator which is acting as phase rotations of the different phase. So basically one of the generators is this quantum symmetry of orifice that I was discussing about. And um, at least I'm planning to have a look at, uh, at these kind of questions, because I think that would be another source of discrete symmetries, which uh, would be nice to, to, to be understood. Yes? Uh, when you have extended cycle, the only particles that will be charged under the discrete symmetry are big extended objects. Uh -huh. Yes. So is there any way around that other than the magnetized brains? Well, uh, for instance, this is typically what happens in these uh, in these uh, compactifications with torsion that the charged objects are wrapped brains and the strings are also charged uh, wrapped objects, so everything is very massive, and it's not obvious what implications that would have for the, for the real world. But for instance, in this uh, in these abelian discrete symmetries and for intersecting brains, when you do the uplifting to uh, <coughs> when you do the uplifting to M theory, essentially becomes or turns into one of these setups with uh, torsion cycles, only that some of the torsion cycles are collapsing. So you could think that perhaps in some regions of modular space, some of these large cycles can go to zero size, and then, then these massive uh, charged objects can become massless at that point in modular space. So on those corners, you could have uh, perhaps uh, something relevant from the point of view of low energies. But generically, at the generic point in modular space, it wouldn't be that, uh, that interesting, perhaps only from an academic point of view that there are these objects, you can do interactions with them, but you don't see anything at low energies, anything else. Can I make a comment on that? I don't, like, we studied um, massive ones in FTV. Mm, yes. Then, uh, these, well, it looks very similar what happens to how they get a mass there. It's again by these forms that are not closed, mm -hmm. but it just looked like they're similar to your construction, but the charge was not, uh, was just one. So there's no discrete symmetry um, associated to it. But under these U1s, these are actually open string U1s, if you like. They're just uplifted geometrically, and then mm -hmm. the normal matter is charged under them. So, like, it's not just, a, I mean, like, the actual standard model can be charged under these massive U1s. Yeah, so yes. Not, like, in your case, they're a closed string for on one U1. But when you uplift this mm -hmm. geometrically to F theory, they're like, uh, you know, standard model is charged. Under. In fact, the diagonal U1, we think, comes from these non closed forms, um, similar to. Mm -hmm. just yeah, comment. I agree. Yes. Mm -hmm. This part, what you're saying. So you're saying if you have an intersecting D6 brain model. Yes. That the the three cycle you get upstairs from the Yukawa coupling mm -hmm. is actually a torsion cycle. Is that what you're saying? Well, ba ba basically, what happens in the M theory lift of these intersecting brain models, which have some discrete uh, asymmetry, is that. Uh, the open strings between the D6 brains become rough membranes, and these are the torsion cycles. And then the world sitting instanton lifts to some chain that makes k of k copies of these torsion cycles to be trivial. So the uh, the torsion cycles are the uplift of the open strings, and then the uplift of the uh, world sitting instanton, if you wish, uh, is a membrane instanton wrapped on the chain ending on these torsion cycles. So before we leave, Joe has some announcements, but in the meantime, let's thank uh, Angela. Okay. Mm -hmm.